Welcome. It is nice to have you all here this day. It's freezing outside, so thank you for coming. <laughs> uh, I just have a few announcements to, to make one. Welcome to all our visitors today. I would love that it meant the word around town about how awesome you are got around, but that is not exactly what happened, though it all holds to be true. There's a baptism today. So we have a lot of guests as part of Kane's baptism. So welcome. And we are delighted to have you here. I have a few announcements, uh, just reminders about uh, when the office hours are and uh, to let you know that top cards are available. And please continue to let us know if there are any prayer requests that we need to add or prayer names we need to remove. The newsletter is coming. I know it's January 30th. You will have a February newsletter. It is coming. Uh, we're trying to reformat stuff. And uh, it's, so it's taking a little time uh, as, as per usual. Uh, and since we're almost into February, you will start to hear words and mention of our Pi Day Pi Sale. So if you would like more information on that, uh, please talk to uh, Jim Clark or to Jenny Kahn's and we'll ask for your help in getting the word out to make sure it is successful. So those are the announcements I have. Um, are, is there any other news or joys and concerns that anyone else would like to lift up at this time? Yes, Michelle. Any minute. Great grandmother, any minute. Excellent. Congratulations, Susan. That's wonderful. So we, we will, uh, in hope and anticipation of a, a new life, that is certainly a joy. Any uh, other joys or concerns? Peter. I just thought it was beneficial that daughter here today. The only word I can only quite normal. I mean, if you see him out on the street, you can take a little bit of time and talk to him or, you know, let him know that you're thinking or care about him or something. So we'll continue to hold Ken Mitchell in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, Ken and Norma are names around town, but also they did used to come to our Wednesday night services from time to time as well. So uh, Norma has passed away. And uh, so Ken is grieving. So let us continue to hold them and hold him in prayer. Thank you, Peter. Any others? And, and Matthew's uh, father, uh, who's waiting on a, a diagnosis to see if he has cancer, we will hold him in prayer. Did I see a hand? Marion. All right, so for Marion's neighbors and others who are suffering uh, from COVID at this time, we lift them up in prayers. All right, let us say now our mission statement that is printed in our bulletin. Be welcoming, be compassionate, be you bravely, be community. 
please join me in the call to worship this day. Jesus calls us into this house of worship. We come with open ears, minds, and hearts. We welcome and accept all who gather here. More importantly, all who are here matter. God desires that we love and we accept those who are the same and those who are different from us. And we help to helps us then, God, to appreciate the gifts that we have bring, brought to your table, accept them today, and use them to further unify our world for the sake of our Lord Jesus the Christ. Thank you for the gifts that you have given to us. Let us sing together our prayer of dedication. and our minds and our bodies as we pray together this prayer of confession. I am, by the way, fully aware that this is the same prayer of confession that we have said all month during January. It was designed that way by the narrative lectionary. So those who are just joining us today, this is the first time you're seeing it. But for those who've been in church every single Sunday or at home online, you have said this prayer multiple times. It was a design in the narrative lectionary like that. I thought I'd try it out. I do not like it. I thank you. <laughs> I don't enjoy saying the same prayer uh, of confession every Sunday. Uh, and so it's going to be changing that going moving forward. So for those of you who noticed, no, it has not been a typo. Pastor Leah did not just get lazy. It was designed that way on purpose by the narrative lectionary people. I tried it out. I don't enjoy it. But I welcome your feedback, because if some of you did, then we'll think about how to incorporate that. So let us pray. That's my confession. That's my pre-confession to our unison confession. Merciful God, Jesus shows us all the ways that we fall short. He also provides us a way out of the holes we dig ourselves into. Forgive us our sins and show us how to make better choices. Be better friends, parents, kids, partners, and coworkers. Let Christ's light shine through us. For the sake of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Jesus does indeed forgives us, cleanses us of our news, our sins, and creates us in the image of God. Receive that entire forgiveness for all your sins as you go and you walk free of shame and guilt. You are made anew. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you. And let us share that peace as we stand together and sing our hymn, hymn number 2150.
be seated. I will take a moment to talk to our young people. Uh, you will have found, I hope, a bulletin uh, on your way in. We have them here and they are also back in the narthex. And it's a bulletin that goes along with the message and the scripture that we're doing. And uh, so that is something for you to enjoy. They call it kid stuff. It's the kid stuff bulletin. So it's designed just for you. Uh, and you can do it in any way that you want to. And um, so we'll make sure if you don't have some that that maybe you uh, can get them. Matthew, will you do me a favor? Will you take some of those kid stuff bulletins and give them to the kids who are sitting in the back over there? Thank you. You'll see them. So I wanted to talk to you today about how to make sure that even those who don't feel that they are cared for know that they are cared for and loved. That's what Jesus does today in today's scripture. So we are going to read about uh, and hear about, and it's a very long story, so I'm going to tell it to you really short. We're going to hear a story today about Jesus going up to a woman at the well. She was a Samaritan woman. Now, Jesus was not a Samaritan man. Jesus was a Jewish man. And so when, men and women at this time didn't talk to each other in public. And also Samaritans and Jewish people didn't talk to each other in public. So what Jesus was doing was very, very brave at the time. And for the woman to answer back was also very brave of her to do at that time. And, but what it is, is a story that reminds us that all of us are children of God. All of us are loved. So what Jesus does is he asks her for some water to drink. And she's a little hesitant to share him with this water. And he tells her in this time, give me something to drink. And as he's drinking this water, he tells her that he has some water for her to drink that will give her life eternal. And what he's talking about is the water that we need that shows us that we are loved and cared for and part of the family of God. So I want you to think this week about people that you hang out with. And maybe to think especially about the person that you have trouble hanging out with. And try hard this week to get to know that person a little bit better to show them that they are loved and they are cared for, just like Jesus did with the woman at the well. So let us pray. God, thank you for an invitation, an invitation that reminds us that you love us and that you care for us, whether we are the same or we are different. In your name we pray, amen. And at this time, I'm going to invite up Cain and his family. There is a special insert in your bulletin. So that you can follow along. Hi. Welcome. How are you, buddy? You were asleep when I met you on Zoom. You don't remember me? You look stunning, though. You look great. And I hear that you have a special message. Do we have it? It's on you. Is it okay if I if I take a better look at your necklace, bud? Look at. I'm not going to take you out of your dad's hands. Don't worry. I just want to look at your cool cross necklace. And I'm going to say a little prayer over it, all right? God bless this necklace to remind and be a visible sign to Cain in this world, and for all others to see and know that he is a beloved child of God. Amen. Hi. Yeah, I know. It can be scary. This, this moment is all about you. So welcome. Your dad's going to hold you the whole time. I'm not going to, I promise you, I'm not going to take you. You're, you're just clinging. That's all right. That's how God clings to us too. So it's a good reminder. You're giving us a visual aid. Yeah. Oh, look at all these people. They all came to see you. Dearly beloved, baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of our Lord Jesus the Christ. It is through this grace that we welcome partakers of his righteousness and heirs to the life eternal. Those receiving the sacrament of baptism 
though it come into the fellowship of Christ's holy church, our Lord has expressly given to little children a place among the people of God, a holy privilege that must not be denied them. Remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and how he said, let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. We follow in that tradition of Jesus and we welcome children into this community. We celebrate the presence of children within this community of faith and offer children the sacrament of baptism. We affirm the love that God has made known in this child and the sacredness of this covenant shared between us and this child, his parents, and this congregation to support this child as he grows in faith. So Joseph and Deidre, you are today presenting your child for baptism. Since baptism is a sacrament, this is a sacred time in the life of these parents and this child and this community of faith. We do not believe that baptism imparts the regenerating grace of God to this child. We do believe that Christ gave this holy sacrament as a sign and seal of a new covenant. Christian baptism signifies for this child God's grace, God's gracious acceptance on the basis of pre pre preventive grace. It is the acknowledgement that this grace is at work in the life of this child within the care of his mother and father and extended, extended family and under the nurture of this community of faith. It is a covenant relationship. It points toward their personal response to the grace with an exercise of conscious saving faith of Jesus Christ. So here's some questions for you. Kane, don't worry, they're answering them for you. But if you want to join in, you can also shout out. We'll, we'll, we'll take it. Friends, in presenting your child for baptism, you are witnessing your own faith in Jesus the Christ. Do you announce your faith in Christ and show that you want to study him, know him, love him, and serve him as a disciple? And that you want your child to do the same, and so say, I do. Will you nurture this child in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example, Cain will be guided to accept God's grace, to profess their faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? If so, say, I will. Will you encourage your child to learn about the wisdom of the prophets doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with God? If so, say, I will. Will you foster your child with an appreciation for the life and the teachings of Jesus? If so, say, I will. Will you teach your child to honor the faith questions that arise in their life? If so, say, I will. Will you journey with your child to discover the wonder of God's love made manifest here this day? If so, say, I will. So we do have godparents. They are not here today because, you know, things happen. They are here, though, in spirit. So in spirit, the parents are going to continue to answer the questions of the God parents. All right. Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Do you trust in him? If so, say, I do. Do you intend your child to be his disciple, to obey his word, and to show his love? If so, say, I do. And as we said, this is a covenant relationship. So here is your question. Jesus calls us to welcome the children into the full light of our community, opening the tables and our hearts to those who are most vulnerable, offering the wisdom of the ages to all who hunger for truth. So do you who witness and celebrate the sacrament on behalf of the church universal, promise your love and support and care of this child being baptized as their lives and grow as they live and grow in this Christian community. If so, say what's printed in your bulletin. We promise our love, support, and our care. Amen. Yeah, we're going to pray. We thank you, God, for the gift of creation made known to us in the water and the word. Before the world has shaped and formed, your spirit moved over the waters. Out of the waters of the deep, you formed the ferment, and he brought forth the earth to sustain all life. 
In the time of Moses, your people Israel passed through the Red Sea waters from slavery to freedom and crossed the flowing Jordan to enter the promised land. You have come to us through the water in the stories of Jesus who nurtured the waters of Mary's womb, baptized by John in the waters of Jordan, and became the living water to a woman at the Samaritan well. Jesus washed the feet of the disciples and sent them forth to baptize with water and spirit. Bless you, O Holy Spirit, gracious God, this water. Bless all who touch and taste this water, that they may be forever reminded of your abiding presence and your claim on our lives. Amen. So we will go over here to the baptismal waters. We're going to pour out this this water that we just blessed, I put a little warmer water in here. This water gets really cold, especially in the winter. See? I don't want your experience with God to be frightening. All right. You want to touch the water? You want to touch it? Yeah. There you go. Kane. Hi. Kane Robert Derla. I baptize you in the name of the Father. <gasps> Doesn't that feel good? And the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's what God's people said. God's people said, amen. And I'm going to give it, you're a little little for this, but I'm going to give it to your mama. She's going to hold on to it for you. And I'm going to give you something else. Come here. You guys can welcome with praise and celebration this newest child of God into this world. This will give to your mama too. This though, Cain, this one is yours. This was made by a woman in our church. Her name is Sue Charles. You don't have to remember her name. Yeah. And this is a prayer shawl so that you know that we're praying for you and we're keeping you in our hearts and our minds as we welcome you into this family of faith. Yes. This child of God is now received into this holy Catholic church. See what great love God has given that we should be called children of God and that we are. Let us all pray these words together. God of wonder and grace, we thank you for your love revealed here this day as this community, these parents, and this child come together making covenant promises. We pray that this community will have the grace to uphold its promises made here this day, providing a safe shelter for your love in which this child may grow and pray. We pray that these parents may continue to feel the sweet wonder of your presence, so transparent here today. And we pray that your child will bask in your love as they make their own journey through this life. Amen. You know, my son did a similar thing when he was baptized. He was given a candle by the priest and blew it out. Just like you just threw that prayer shawl. Yeah. May the love and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. And as Cain goes back to his seat, we'll invite Peter Ford to read. And you can applaud again. Because it is joyful. Yes, yeah, thank you. The prayer of illumination, God of unity, Jesus broke down barriers wherever he went. Teach us to treat people like they matter because they do. Amen. In the first Testament reading of Psalm 42 verses one through three, as a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of my God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me continually, where is your God? The words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second testament comes from John chapter 4, verses 1 through 42. Hear the words of the Lord. 
Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but it was the disciples who baptized, he left Judea and he started back to Galilee, but he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar and near the plot of ground that God had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon, and a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food, and the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not do things in common with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying this to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you the living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well, and the sons of his flock who drank from it? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. And Jesus said to her, go and call your husband and come back. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one who you are with now is not your husband. What you have said is true, the woman said to him. Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when we will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know, and we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all these things. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking. Just then the disciples came and they were astonished that he was speaking to a woman. But no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking to her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city and said to the people, come and see this man who has told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? And they left the city and they were on their way to him. And meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do not say four months more than the harvest, then comes the harvest. But I tell you, look around and see the fields that are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for this eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from the city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And the more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you have said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this truly is the savior of the word, world. Friends, these are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. You alone my strength unto you. To you alone may my spirit you alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. Our souls thirst for God. They thirst for God. Being thirsty is something you might have experienced on a hot summer day. Maybe it's something you've experienced after a, a walk or a run. Maybe you've known thirst as you were preparing for a surgery and you're not allowed to have anything to eat or to drink. Maybe you have known thirst and seen it in the dry soil or in your yard or in your gardens. When our bodies start to run low on water, a number of changes take place. Our blood decreases, which causes then change to our blood pressure. Right, so we need steady fluids in order to transport our nutrients to eliminate waste, to lubricate and cushion our joints. And to some extent, our bodies are designed to compensate for water depletion. They mess with our heart rate, our blood pressure, they tweak our kidney functions to retain more water. But you know you are wanting something to drink when you begin to feel thirsty. And indeed, you should drink something. So that's what it means to be thirsty. But what does it mean and how do our bodies run when our thirst is quenched? Well, our body temperature is regulated. Our joints are lubricated. We are prevented from some infections. Our nutrient, our cells are getting nutrients. Our organs are functioning properly. We're able to have better sleep and we're in a better mood. Being hydrated is crucial for our healthy life, for our body and our mind and our spirit. And this is what Jesus is offering at the well. Quench thirst for a soul that is longing for God. And he appeared and the soul felt its worth. The soul thirsted no more. Water is powerful. As we saw today at this baptismal font. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give you will become in you a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. And the woman said, I would say the woman begged, sir, give me this water. We have also wanted this water as that deer. We long for the water that Jesus gives, water that once we drink, we will never be thirsty again. So Jesus continues to talk with her. And as he's talking with her, he seems to say, if you want this water, this water that I'm going to give you, then you're going to have to be honest. He's holding up this mirror for her. You have to be honest with who you have been in order to fully embrace who you are. We cannot truly repent which means to turn back, right? We can't turn our lives to God if we're constantly doing this, right? If we're constantly looking back. If we keep looking back and refuse to be accountable for our lives. Now, Jesus isn't saying we should be ashamed of this. Jesus isn't shaming her in this moment for her life choices. He's seeing her. And in seeing her, he is helping her to see herself as well. That she's a woman, a woman who had five husbands, a woman who's with a man that is not her husband. And even so, she's allowed to drink from this well. Even so, she is still a child of God, much beloved. She's still allowed to drink from what God is offering her and not be thirsty again. And then the text goes on to remind us that we don't live by water alone. 
Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. No, Jesus is not hoarding snacks from the disciples. He's not refusing to share with them. He is, of course, talking about a different kind of food, just like he was talking about a different kind of water. But we need both food and water in order to live. So it's not surprising in this text that Jesus is reminding us we have to do both. We have to drink and we have to eat. So the disciples turned to each other and said, surely no one has brought him something to eat. They were also wondering if Jesus was hoarding his snacks. And Jesus said to him, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Food is the fuel. Fuel is another way to say that our bodies take that. Some people don't like the expression, I do. But that our bodies convert what we eat into, right, the energy that we need to live so we can have our best lives. And we cannot complete the work of God without food. So a healthy, balanced diet gives our body the nutrients that we need. It gives us the energy that we need. It keeps our heart beating. It keeps our brain active. It keeps our muscles working. It keeps us in better moods to deal with people, or at least it does me. Maybe that's just me. It helps us to build up our bodies, to strengthen our bones and our muscles and our tissues. So we need carbohydrates that give our body energy and our brain and our muscles and our hearts and our lungs. We need protein that helps our body to repair the damage, right? And we need fat, not our Snickers bar fat, but our avocado fat, right? Our oils, right? Because these help to cover around our nerves, right? It helps our body to cover our nerves. It helps us to make hormones. When Jesus start, started his talking about how we get the food then, because the food just doesn't appear out of nowhere. So Jesus goes immediately to talking about this harvest, that the work that goes into harvesting the food we eat. He says, do not say to me, do not say four months more and then comes the harvest. But I tell you to look around and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For I am here to tell you that the saying holds true. One reaps, one sows. I sent you to reap that which you did not labor for, and others have labored and have now entered into their labor. Now I am not, nor have I ever been a farmer. I know that the work of a farmer is hard and it is constant. It is never ending. And as I read these words, I wonder if what Jesus is reminding us to do is that we have to be present. We have to be in this moment, not waiting for a perfect time four months from now. Not waiting for some perfect time to do the work of God, but right now, right now with what you have in this field that you're standing in, a reminder that the kingdom of God is in you and you work in the field that you find yourself currently in. We don't save it up to do it elsewhere. Jesus and the disciples were not in their community, right? They weren't with their people. They were with the Samaritans who were not their people. In fact, they were people with whom they had a rather divisive path. And Jesus focuses them then on changing their behaviors, eating and drinking and talking and communing with people they would otherwise ignore. So changing their behaviors, but not their beliefs. That is a title of a recent podcast from Hidden Brain. I do recommend it, just as an aside. So I wanted to lift up a story in the podcast that uh, Sean Corbidonton spoke about. And it made me think about the work that Jesus did to change the behaviors of people he encountered, not their beliefs. The goal wasn't to change their beliefs, it was to change their behaviors. So in this podcast, they share a story about Greeks and, and Turkey. And there was this huge earthquake in the summer of 1999. 
And it led to an improvement in the relationship between those two countries. Prior to this, it had generally been rather volatile. This is how much I don't know about world history sometimes. So this is new, this was new for me. All right, so they had been, Greece had won its independence from the Ottoman Empire. It's a long time ago. And the so-called earthquake diplomacy generated outpouring of sympathy and assistance and provided for both the Greeks and the Turks. And their actions took the world by the storm. So there was this huge earthquake in Turkey and they needed help. And the people that gave it to them were the least likely people. They were the Greeks. In there, somebody decided the secretary of civil perfections equipped a medical team of 11 people and doctors and tents were made and mobile units were done, ambulances, medicine, water, clothing, food, blankets. They called upon their planes for transportation. They set up three units for blood donations. They initiated a fundraiser. They literally gave the Turkish people blood from their bodies in order to help and save them and act a behavior they had never done before. And less than a month after the Turkish disaster, Greece had one. They were also hit by an earthquake with a magnitude of 5.9. It was the most devastating and costly natural disaster that had hit Greece in 20 years. And this time, because of the way Greece responded to the Turkish people, the Turkish people reciprocated their aid. And they gave back too, sent a rescue team, on-site military planes, gave their blood. Even one person donated their kidney to somebody in need their behavior towards each other began to change. And I'm sure that the beliefs that they hold true about each other began to change later, but the behaviors changed first. We see that in the way Jesus talked to the people, changing their behaviors, changing their communities. He sat and ate with people he'd otherwise not eat with. He took water at a well from a woman he wasn't even supposed to be talking to. Jesus does it in water and in food. And then throughout that, as they stayed there with the people, not thinking of themselves as separate from, but together at the table of God, many Samaritans then in the city began to believe what this woman had told them. And they came to Jesus and they started to talk to them. And then they said to her, it is no longer because of what you have told us that we believe. We have heard it, we have seen it ourselves. And we know that truly this is the savior of the world. The way that Jesus fought, watered and fed people and was present with them, they knew that they were encountering the savior of the world. And Jesus tells us and encourages us to model this behavior, go and do likewise, teaching us a new way of being and loving in the world. He changed the behaviors and in doing so tore down the barriers that separated the people of God. Each time an obstacle is removed. When our thirst is quenched, when our belly is full, we can fully engage in the work of God. Jesus wants the people of God to live full lives, not the pleaded ones. God didn't create us so we could run our lives on empty, so that we could wait for perfect moments not our lives. God didn't create us so that our lives could be divided. But we are to live in this field. To have a life and relationship with that person that is standing directly in front of us. And not to make them feel ashamed. Not to make them feel hungry and thirsty. But so they feel welcome and accepted exactly as they are. So let us change our behaviors. Let us eat and drink and taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Amen. And in that, as an affirmation of faith, we are going to sing, take my life and let it be. And we're only singing the first three verses. So when you open your hymnal and go, that's a lot of verses, 
We're only singing the first three. church and the world and all those in need. Our souls learn thirst for God. And we ask that God satisfy our longing with true refreshment rather than fleeting pleasures. Teach us how to offer this life-giving water to others, renewing God hear our prayer. Our souls thirst for you, O oh Lord. Droughts parch one part of the earth while melting oceans and floodwaters drown another. Show us the folly of our greed and short-sightedness and make us part of the solution to heal our struggling planet, renewing God, hear our prayer. God, our th souls thirst for you. Show us the place where we have been blind to your vision. Give us the wisdom and the courage to dismantle those things that divide us from others, renewing God, hear our prayer. God, our souls thirst for you, that your life-giving water is exactly what a suffering world needs. Pour it out upon all of those who desire an extra measure of your grace. Renewing God, hear our prayer. God, we are satisfied just being in your presence, O oh Lord. Accept our prayers and use us to relieve others of their burdens for the sake of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, may you go in peace and grace to be the hands and the feet of Jesus to touch this broken world. May you go in grace and peace to love the world on behalf of Christ and represent him. May you go in grace and peace to discover the joy of joining the work of our Lord and Savior, finding him amongst the people. Amen.